By the summer of 1830, at the ripe old age of 24 years old, Joseph Smith already had two monumental accomplishments under his new prophetic belt. The Book of Mormon was translated and printed, and in April, the church was formally organized. What next for him? Well, the answer came in the Bible, quite literally. Just two months after the church's organization, Joseph's next prophetic mission was to translate the Bible. This was an audacious undertaking for a 24-year-old living in the wilderness of North America. The Holy Bible was the cornerstone of Western civilization, and Joseph Smith had no academic training or worldly experience, and had likely never read the Bible cover to cover himself. Even so, he moved forward undaunted. He considered this translation of the Bible a branch of his calling, and had divine revelation authorizing him to do it. He made significant changes to Genesis, Exodus, Psalms, Isaiah, Matthew, Luke, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, and Revelation. He made no changes to Ruth, Ezra, Esther, and some other Old Testament books, as well as no changes to 2nd or 3rd John. Famously, he called the Song of Solomon uninspired. The Joseph Smith translation of the Bible was a launch pad of revelation for Joseph Smith himself. Half of our Doctrine and Covenants revelations came during the time period when Joseph was engaged translating the Bible. Many of his Doctrine and Covenants revelations stem directly from his translation of the Bible. But what does that mean that Joseph translated the Bible? Was he putting it back into its earliest original form? Was he editing the Bible? Was he revising it to be more clear? Was he helping to interpret its meaning and passages? Was he giving modern relevant application to its teachings? If this were a multiple choice test, the answer to these questions would likely best be all of the above. Dr. Jared Ludlow, currently the Publications Director of the Religious Studies Center, has recently published an insightful article in BYU Studies called The Joseph Smith Translation of the Bible, Ancient Material Restored or Inspired Commentary, Canonical or Optional, Finished or Unfinished. Dr. Ludlow explores these questions in this article and more. It may not be as much restoring ancient text, meaning this was on an ancient manuscript, but it maybe is restoring ancient understandings or ancient doctrine. Uh, how they understood this maybe got lost over time, and Joseph Smith is restoring that understanding of what these things meant to those people at that time. In today's episode, get ready to translate the definition of translation and better understand the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. This is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Recently, Professor Ludlow sat down with his Ancient Scripture colleague and Why Religion team member, Ryan Sharp, to talk about his research publications related to the Joseph Smith translation, along with Joseph's translations about the prophet Enoch. In part one, he will give us an overview of the JST and address what Joseph Smith was doing with it. He will also address common questions about whether Joseph finished his translation and why we don't have all of the JST in our printed version of the LDS Bible. He also will discuss some of his research on Joseph's expansive translation of the prophet Enoch. In part two, as usual, he will move a little bit more as to why this research matters and talk more about some of the application related to the Joseph Smith translation to help us with our study of the Bible. And in part three, he will tell us a little bit more about his own academic journey and his own faith. So here is Dr. Jared Ludlow with his colleague, Dr. Ryan Sharp. 
So we're here to talk today about the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible and a recent article uh, that you have had published with BYU Studies. Before we get into our discussion about the Joseph Smith translation, though, I'd love to begin with kind of the genesis of the project and and what's piqued your interest as it relates to the Joseph Smith translation, and, and how did this article come to be? The, I was approached several years ago by the editors uh, who wanted to do a volume on what they called open topics, things in the church that maybe we haven't had a definitive revelation that said, it's this. Uh, and so you have some opinions on one side and you have some opinions on the other. And they asked if I'd be willing to do something on the Joseph Smith translation. And I had done a little bit of work on the Joseph Smith translation related to the New Testament, uh, kind of looking at how does the Joseph Smith translation present some of the stories as far as from like a narratological perspective? Uh, does it still have the same characters? Is there additional dialogue? These kinds of things. And, and it was really interesting to see how the Joseph Smith translation, even within the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, had carried over some of the same characteristics of each of these gospel writers, uh, even within the Joseph Smith translation. And so they approached me about this, and kind of a unique thing, I guess, how this volume ended up going was BYU Studies picked it up and decided to do both a journal issue of all of these pieces, as well as then publish a book uh, of the same material. And so mine is one chapter of several that, you know, try to tackle these so-called open topics. Oh, very interesting. Uh, as our listeners begin their study of the Old Testament, I'm guessing many of them would love to hear you explain kind of the basics of what the Joseph Smith translation is. Uh, in the article, you explain that the JST differs from the King James Version in about 3,410 verses, a third of those in the Old Testament and two-thirds in the New Testament. And in your introduction, you write, Joseph Smith began an ambitious program to revise the biblical text in June of 1830, not long after the organization of the Church of Christ and the publication of the Book of Mormon. While the result came to be known as the Joseph Smith translation, it was not a literal word-for-word -word translation of ancient biblical languages from a manuscript, but more of an inspired revision or paraphrase based on the King James Version in English, carried out primarily between June 1830 and July 1833. So, what else would you add in introducing our listeners to the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible? Yeah, it was, as I mentioned, quite an ambitious project. I think anybody trying to tackle anything biblical, it's a biblical proportions, right? It's a, it's a massive undertaking. I see what you did there, Jared. Yeah. You can't sneak that by me. <laughs> and what's kind of interesting is he starts with Genesis 1-1, and he's moving through the Old Testament, but then the Lord comes to him and tells him to jump to the New Testament. I believe he's in 1 Samuel, I want to say chapter 20 or 21, something like that. And so he goes to the New Testament and works through that book. And then he comes back and will finish the Old Testament. And so chronologically, there's kind of this, you know, half and half with the Old Testament very early on and then uh, slightly later. Uh, Maybe one other little interesting thing about that is when he finishes the Old Testament, his Bible has an Apocrypha section, and so he asked the Lord in section 91, should I translate this as part of the uh, this project? And the Lord's response, as we have recorded in section 91, is no. And there's some truths in it, but there's also interpolations of men. And so that kind of, I guess, answered the question of the Apocrypha in relation to our canon, uh, that's the only place I see where it's ever really dealt with. And so it's not part of our canon, but it was a question that Joseph Smith had related to that. I guess another maybe interesting thing about the JST is there are places where there's dramatic differences, additions, even some deletions. But then there's other places where it's just a random word here or there. And so it's certainly not consistent as far as the amount of 
treatment done on the text. Yeah, and, and that's actually where I wanted to go next. Um, one of the questions that uh, that I'm often asked is, I mean, essentially, what is the function of the JST? Uh, specifically, is it always a restoration of, of ancient text? And, and you deal with that uh, here in this article. You say a common early explanation for the JST is the restoration of lost original text, building upon the teachings found in the Book of Mormon of plain and precious things being removed from the Bible by the great and abominable church. Many looked at the JST as remedying this corruption. So maybe speak a little bit more uh, about that and, and about the function of the JST in restoring original text. I think probably our knee-jerk reaction is to think that, yeah, this somehow was on an ancient manuscript at some point, and it got lost either by inadvertent errors of transmission of copying or by purposeful uh, changes, as the Book of Mormon seems to allude to. And I think that's certainly one option for some things uh, that could have happened. Uh, But I think probably to refine that a little bit better would be to say it may not be as much restoring ancient text, meaning this was on an ancient manuscript, but it maybe is restoring ancient understandings or ancient doctrine. Uh, How they understood this maybe got lost over time, and Joseph Smith is restoring that understanding of what these things meant to those people at that time. And, uh, And I love that. And kind of in the spirit of this idea of open questions, what are some of the other range of options? So is it is it always restoring ancient texts? And, and I like the way that, that you describe that. Um, what are some other possibilities in what the Joseph Smith translation is doing? I think some of what the Joseph Smith translation is doing is simply modernizing uh, the spelling of some things, the way of saying things. Of course, we have the King James English, which is 400 years old, and... <clears throat> We don't always go around saying he doeth this or he goeth there. Some of us do, but yeah, I can see how others. (laughs) And so, you know, some of that are just simple changes that make it uh, read better in in English today, or in Joseph Smith's day, I should say. Uh, So that's pretty easy to see. Uh, I think sometimes it may be prophetic explanation that from his role as a a seer, he's uh, maybe interpreting a little bit of what this might mean so that we can understand it better. Or it's part of this revelatory experience that he's having. And so, for example, in Come, Follow Me, the beginning of the year, we study Moses 1. Well, there's no equivalent to Moses 1 in Genesis uh, or any of the books of Moses. And so this is part of the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis. So where was this? Was it on an ancient manuscript, or is this a revelatory experience that Moses had that Joseph Smith now is given to to experience and that he records now for us? And so some of what maybe is going on in the Joseph Smith translation is is through Revelation having similar experiences to what the original prophets may have had. And and so, I guess to clarify a couple of things, so we have various changes. Some of them are tweaking language to modernize the text. Some of them could be potentially restoring either ancient ideas or or even some ancient wording there. Um, But others are capturing this vision that wasn't previously recorded, but Joseph Smith is is receiving that and being commanded to include that in his uh, project. Am, am I saying that the right way? Yeah. I guess another example would be Enoch, because we have, what, five verses about Enoch in Genesis, and yet we have a few chapters in the book of Moses about Enoch. And so that's obviously expanding far beyond what ends up being in the canonical account. I guess one other way that the JST also works, and this you see mostly in the New Testament where you have the Gospels, uh, sometimes there's you know contradictions about whether there's two angels or one angel at the tomb or something, and the JST sometimes will go in and 
harmonize, I guess, uh, those uh, differences. Yeah, and making it easier for modern readers to to look through those. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm I'm going to keep going through some common questions that people ask about the the JST because I think your article really lends itself to that and is is trying to tackle some of these things. So another question that is often asked about the the Joe Smith translation is. Is it finished or is it not finished? Sometimes the question is, you know, why do we not use that as our as our primary text? And and one of the answers that some people give is because the project wasn't ever finished. Is that true? Talk to us a little bit about whether or not he he would have considered it done. That's a great question because you'll see scholars today coming down pretty strong on both sides of this question. Uh Joseph Smith did work through the entire Bible and finish in that sense. And so he had notes through the entire Bible. And it seemed like he had intended that it is ready for publication. They just never, because of things going on or financial funds, these kinds of things, they never were able to publish it. And so it does open this question of, was he still going to be working on it, revising it, you know, adapt, you know, changing some things down the road? And that's where Latter-day Saints struggle sometimes with the Joseph Smith translation is because we didn't have access or control of the manuscripts for it for a century uh or more, um, because the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, now known as the Community of Christ, they retained um, access to these manuscripts. They published a version of the Bible that incorporated uh, a lot of the Joseph Smith translation. But we weren't always sure, is this accurate? Is this what was on the original manuscripts? And I think that's where Robert J. Matthews was really important, and I believe in the early 1970s, of building relationships of trust with uh, the community of Christ, back then the reorganized church um, scholars, and was granted access uh, to the these manuscripts and was able to confirm that, yeah, basically they were accurate. And, and so once we were able to get access to these and, and actually feel confident about them, that's then when we start seeing them uh, incorporated into our edition of the scriptures in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, with the, back then the new edition of the Latter-day Saint scriptures. And you mentioned um, Robert Matthews. What are some of the other uh, thing, contributions that he made to our understanding of the Joseph Smith translation? A key thing that he did was he was part of the scriptures committee uh, in the 1970s to prepare this new edition of the scriptures. And he kind of determined some of the criteria for what should be included or not. And that's maybe one part of the article that uh, maybe came across sounding a little more mystical or something <laughs> uh, that we don't know the process. But uh, what I kind of meant by that was it's nowhere spelled out in our edition of the scriptures why certain ones were included where just we know that some in the appendix were put there because they were longer but you know why little words here and there were and why others weren't because we don't have the complete joseph smith translation in our footnotes and appendix there's other parts that weren't included but he did have some criteria where primarily he was focusing on doctrine if he felt like the jo Joseph Smith translation changed or altered our understanding of the doctrine, then it should be included. Uh, but if it didn't really change that much, well, then that may be one that you just leave out. Because space-wise, they just couldn't include, all of include it. everything. A another question that is often asked is, do we consider the Joseph Smith translation part of our canon? Is it... Uh, is it canonical? How do you answer that, and and uh, how should we think about that? I mean, to be honest, it's kind of a yes and no. Part of it is definitely canonical because it's part of the Pearl of Great Price. Uh, two parts of it of the Pearl of Great Price are come from the J Joseph Smith translation. We have the Book of Moses, 
and we have Joseph Smith Matthew. Both of these are part of that project that Joseph Smith was doing. And so when um, Elder Richards in England starts compiling what really was kind of a pamphlet for early saints that he ends up calling the Pearl of Great Price, he pulls on some of these parts of the Joseph Smith translation that had been earlier published in church periodicals. And later on, when other saints, particularly back here in Utah, start seeing these saints from England coming with this little Pearl of Great Price, they're wondering, well, wait, we want this too. What is this? And that's, I think it was in 1880 when they officially canonized the Pearl of Great Price. So those definitely are part of, you know, our scripture uh, canon or standard works. Now, in the 1980-ish edition, we have other parts that are included in the appendix and the footnotes. And so you could say they're part of our scripture. Um, however, we've never officially voted in a general conference to accept this as part of our canon. However, I think we could maybe draw a distinction between canon and authority. I think a lot of church leaders would consider the Joseph Smith translation authoritative, that we can go to it for doctrinal understanding, for testimony, uh, even if it's not officially canonized. And we have a lot of other examples of things that aren't necessarily in our scriptures, but that we definitely turn to for doctrinal understanding. Like the living Christ, the family proclamation. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of the first presidency proclamations, these kinds of things. So if, if our listeners are wondering why we don't have all of those changes and, and why they're maybe not printed as part of our scriptures, how do you answer that? I think we, <clears throat> I mean, I'm kind of... And I'm not asking you to be the authoritative <laughs> voice of the church right now. I'm just curious as a teacher, how, how do you respond to questions like that? Because I'm guessing, again, especially where we're working our way through the Old Testament and Pearl of Great Price with Come Follow Me, the, these are questions that are on the minds of, of our listeners. Right. I mean, the way I often respond to my students about this would be, we're already different enough from other Christians, for example, that to add to have our complete new, different Bible would be just one more hurdle to try to overcome. Hmm. And so we've kept the King James Version as our primary Bible uh, because a lot of, particularly in the 1800s, a lot of people recognize that as an authoritative uh, version of Scripture. And... And so we've just, I guess, complemented the King James Version with these footnoted or in the appendix additions or deletions, um, but didn't alter the entire text. Uh, and so I think, you know, that's probably, at least to me, that makes logical sense of, of trying to incorporate a lot of this. Uh, but because of space, not being able to incorporate all of it, but still maintain a foundation, foundational text that we can share with other Christians that they would recognize. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this publication, BYU's Religious Studies Center is a great place to check out. Since we are talking about the Joseph Smith translation in this very episode, I have to bring your attention to a recent publication from the RSC called Joseph Smith's Translation of the Bible, the Joseph Smith Translation and the King James Translation in parallel columns, edited by Kent Jackson, an emeritus BYU religion professor and Joseph Smith Translation scholar. This publication brings you the complete text of the Bible revision made by Joseph Smith presented with modern punctuation and spelling, and with the original chapter and verse divisions created by Joseph Smith and his scribes, published in parallel columns with corresponding verses of the King James Bible. It's a wonderful resource to get the entire work of the translation in one publication. Again, the book is called Joseph Smith's Translation of the Bible, 
the Joseph Smith translation and the King James translation in parallel columns by Kent Jackson. Check it out and pick it up at rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Dr. Jared Ludlow discuss his research on the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible and on the prophet Enoch. In part two of our religion, we like to get a little bit more into why this study matters and push towards application about how it helps us to learn, live, and apply aspects of the restored gospel. So here is Dr. Ludlow and Dr. Sharp exploring some of those why questions. You mentioned earlier the story of Enoch and the, the book of Moses. The, the most extensive and what some would probably say the most significant Joseph Smith translation contribution is the book of Moses and specifically the, the story of Enoch. You also recently published a chapter entitled uh, Enoch Walked with God and He Was Not, and then Where Did Enoch Go After Genesis? So I'm going to ask an incredibly unfair question uh, because we don't have time to delve deeply in, into this uh, topic in this article, but I'd love to get some of the highlights from that and, and your experience and understanding of Enoch and, and maybe a few things that, that you discuss in that article. Whenever you talk about Enoch, of course you start with Genesis, and it's a very brief account of Enoch, where he walked with God and then he was not. Well, this is very ambiguous. <laughs> this is like, well, what does that mean? First, that he walked with God. And then secondly, that he was not. And so it <clears throat> leaves open this wide gap of Enoch. What happened to him? What happened? You know, what did he do? Why was he walking with God that he was so successful, but then he's not? And so I think in these later texts, and, and this even includes the New Testament. I mean, we see Enoch showing up in the book of Hebrews, for example, as this great example of faith. There seems to be more about Enoch out there than obviously those brief verses in the book of Genesis. Now, the cynical scholar could say, oh, well, these are just all later creations that try to fill in that gap. What happened to Enoch? Well, let's make it up, some later Jewish writer says, and creates this whole new text. And I think certainly that could happen in some of these cases, that they, these later Jewish writers see a gap, and they know that Enoch has greater authority than themselves, so they put it under his authority. And this is what we see in a lot of texts that we call the pseudepigrapha. These are t Jewish texts related to the Old Testament figures, where they falsely ascribe, that's what the title pseudepigrapha specifically means, they falsely ascribe the, the writing of it to these earlier figures. In an effort to add authority to whatever it is they're saying. Yeah, exactly. Stephen Robinson, uh, in an article about this, called it lying for God, <laughs> <laughs> meaning they're not Enoch, they're not Abraham, they're not Moses, but... They are trying to do something to help people draw closer to God, and, and so they use the authority of that early figure. I'm a, of a little slightly different opinion that I don't think these are all just later creations, particularly when you see similar traits and motifs shared among many of them. I think there were other stories, either oral and or written, accounts of Enoch that didn't make Genesis or other parts of the Old Testament, but show up in these later texts. And so they were transmitted over time and then finally written down and maybe developed into other ways. Uh, but, you know, that they, they, they weren't just a later creation, that they were transmitted and then developed uh, later on. And so I think that's part of what goes on with Enoch. He's often associated with what's called the book of the, or the story of the Watchers. And I said book of the Watchers because that's one of the sections of, of the book of Enoch. Um, the Watchers, if, if you remember in the book of Genesis, it talks about sons of God and the daughters of men, and that the sons of God desired the daughters of men, and, the, and then they slept with them and, and then created this 
what they call giants, this kind of new group of people. Well, that story is also found in a lot of later texts, and Enoch is often associated with this as a mediator figure trying to resolve this. And the way that these later texts often portray it is these sons of God are actually angelic figures, and the daughters of men are mortals, and so it's this taboo blending of angelic with uh, mortal flesh, and that's what creates the so-called giants and so forth. So Enoch is stepping in and trying to mediate this. And so you see an element there of his teaching, of his petitioning to God, uh, of trying to help mortals become better, these kinds of things, that you see alluded to a little bit in the Book of Moses account of Enoch, uh, of what he tried to do with the wicked people around him and, and trying to call them to repentance and so forth. Uh, and so that's what a, a lot of these texts later on about Enoch will talk about. And then others will dive into more of kind of his heavenly status or role, um, either as a, a scribe at the judgment scene or, you know, a, a figure almost like a, almost like a Jehovah figure, uh, a, a deliverer figure that's developed so how how would you situate Moses six and seven within this broader literature? Obviously, we're not suggesting it's pseudepigraphal or anything. It's uh, you know we, we would we would say that it's a, a revelation and and how would you situate these revelations within that broader context? See, this is where I would see you know there's kernels of the story that you can see developed in different ways in other stories, and the, some of the kernels that I think are there is that there's a wicked people. Uh, in the book of Moses, it's not angelic figures and mortals. It's those who are covenant people and those who aren't, and warning against kind of that intermarriage and that corruption that can occur if if you give up your covenants to uh, go with other people. Uh, and so that's one kernel. You see Enoch teaching these people, trying to call them to repentance, and you see that in a lot of other texts. Um, and then, you know, we get to this, and he was not, this question of, you know, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about Enoch being taken up into heaven, translated, as we call it, uh, but in the book of Moses, it's not just Enoch, it's entire community that is taken up with him, and so his teaching has resulted in helping a whole community to repent and, and to be worthy to be translated uh, into heaven. And and so you see, you know, the, the shared similarities of, of a translation, but adding the community aspect to it, uh, you know, a city of Zion. And this will become very important, I think, to early Latter-day Saints, this concept of can we create a community righteous enough to be like the community of Enoch, maybe even righteous enough to be taken up uh, into God's presence. So all of this discussion is under the umbrella of the Joseph Smith translation. Um, one of the things that we try to do in these interviews is help the, the listeners find relevance in, in the work that's being done. But maybe a, a couple of specific questions as it relates to why this matters and how it can help. We've talked about some of the Joseph Smith translation changes are in footnotes. Some are canonized, like the the Book of of Moses. Um, some are in the appendix. If if I'm a listener and I want to dive in more deeply into the Joseph Smith translation, where do I go? How do I access that? Well, I think the first place, of course, would be to read carefully the Book of Moses and Joseph Smith Matthew. Those are right there in kind of more complete form, if you will. Um, there are some um, books out there that talk about the coming forth of the, the Joseph Smith translation um, by Kent Jackson. And, and speaking of Kent Jackson, the Religious Studies Center is uh, has just published, it should be coming sometime this month, uh, a complete side-by-side Two column King James Version Joseph Smith translation mm. for the entire Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, Tom Wayman earlier had 
uh, published the complete Old Testament Joseph Smith translation and I think a complete New Testament uh, Joseph Smith translation, but this will put it all together in one volume. Um, and so there are some resources like that that will try to incorporate the Joseph Smith translation often in columns side by side with the King James Version so you can kind of see where things are different. Um, and so that's, you know, one place to start. I think what I've liked to do in my printed scriptures, I know people are going less and less uh, to their printed scriptures, but you could also do this with your electronic with highlighting, is I would try to um, highlight, you know, in the verse where there's a JST in the footnote so that I would know that I can look and see that there's something either in the footnote or in the appendix uh, that helps clarify something in that verse. And so that can be, I think, a good place to start is, if nothing else, just to manually go through yeah. and make sure you have you note uh, all those places so that when you come to that verse in your reading or you know, in gospel doctrine class or something, you know, hey, there's a JST uh, edition here. And, and one more kind of follow-up with that. Any other advice as, as uh, each of us dive into the Old Testament and, and these parts of the Pearl of Great Price we've been discussing? Uh, any other advice on incorporating the JST in, into our study and making it more meaningful? I would think as we are doing the Old Testament this year, um, if you notice, we started with two parts of the Pearl of Great Price— Book of Moses and Book of Abraham selections, um, appreciating the contribution of Joseph Smith to our doctrinal understanding. Why did we start there? Well, because there's information about premortal life that we don't get anywhere else. Paying attention to some of these doctrinal um, aspects that are unique particularly, or that at least give us new understanding than others that don't have it, I think is an important uh, thing to pay attention to. And then I think the other thing is um, it gives us some insight, again, on people who anciently were trying to make covenants with God and keep covenants with God and paying attention to what they did to try to draw closer to God maybe can help inform us as we are making covenants with God and trying to, as President Nelson says, stay on the covenant path. What are some things that we can do to draw closer to God and to, to make sure those covenants are really important to us and that we, they're at the forefront of what we're trying to do? And we have some good examples uh, in these figures in the Old Testament. Now, I will also say that you know, they do some things that we wouldn't agree with. But I think that's why it's in the Scriptures, to learn not only from the great things they did, but also from some of the mistakes so that maybe we can avoid those mistakes. Because I'm sure, but for any of us, uh, there's going to be mistakes as well as some good things that we did in our lives. And I don't think I would want all my mistakes shared in scripture for all to read, and yet that's what's happened with some of these figures. And so we don't want to just whitewash and say they, they were perfect, because they would say they weren't perfect, but we can learn from that of how to be good covenant makers and, and keepers. If you're interested in reading all of Dr. Ludlow's article on the Joseph Smith Translation of the Bible published in BYU Studies, we've provided a link to it on our website at whyreligion.byu.edu, where you can get access to the full article. There, you can also read more about Dr. Ludlow, as well as get access to links of articles from past episodes. And if you're loving what you're getting from Why Religion, please do us a favor and leave us a rating on your podcast platform as it helps in the promoting algorithms so others can continue to find and be blessed by this great content provided from these professors. Well, we've come to our final part of this episode of Why Religion, where we like to explore why this professor chooses faith and why they chose to be a BYU religion professor. Here is Dr. Jared Ludlow wrapping up, answering some of these questions. <laughs> 
In our last section, we we try to get a little more personal and, and understand a little bit more about you. Uh, and, and so maybe the impromptu question I'm going to ask can and can serve as a, a segue, but I, I love what you were saying earlier about the function of the Joseph Smith translation and how it can help us gain a deeper appreciation for the prophet and, and for his work. I'm curious, having spent considerable time in, in the Joseph Smith translation, how has that happened for you? What how has stu- spending time studying as you have the Joseph Smith translation deepened your faith and appreciation of the prophet? I think one area that I came to appreciate more studying the JST and particularly the Book of Moses and the story of Enoch was how much the prophet Joseph Smith emphasized this aspect of community of having a community of love, of righteousness, of no poor among us. I mean, that was the ideal. That was the goal. That was what he was striving for. And those are beautiful principles and things that we would want for a community. And where's he getting a lot of that notion? From the story of Enoch in the Book of Moses. And so to gain a little bit more insight into creating a Zion-like community still today. I mean, that's still our goal as a, as a church, as a neighborhood, is to create a community where we love each other, where we try to have no poor among us, where we are striving to be righteous. Um, we're just building upon what they were trying to do back then. And and I think another thing that I've come to appreciate, you know, sometimes you see some of the changes in the JST and you think, oh, you know, anybody could have done that. Um, but then there's other parts that you think, wow, this is like prophetic, for lack of a better word. I mean, this is um, expanding our knowledge of or our eternal perspective of things. Um, And even in this piece that I did with the New Testament narrators, you know, I thought he didn't know these narrative strategies of each of the gospel writers, and yet the changes seem to fall into line with a lot of what were characteristics that were in these gospel writers. And, And that kind of amazed me that, and seemed to me that, you know, again, it was by... This was all a a revelatory process. It was not because Joseph Smith knew Hebrew or Greek really well. He'd he'd like to study them, and he wanted to know them better, but a lot of this was very early on before he even started studying some of that. And so this is all just through inspiration, through revelation. Uh, And so just appreciating the contribution to know, you know, we often talk about the Book of Mormon being an aid to knowing that Joseph Smith is a prophet, and I, I certainly believe that, and I have a testimony of that. But the JST also could can show us that here's a prophet at work, uh, revealing things that we wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, eloquently put. Thank you for sharing that. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better. Tell us about your training, uh, your your background. What did you study? Where did you study? Uh, help us kind of get into your world a little bit. Well, I don't know how far back you want to go. <laughs> I was born here in Provo. No, I think BYU, of course, is at the center of a lot of my life because I had a father who taught here in the religion department, and I had the opportunity as a, as a youth to go to Jerusalem on a, with the BYU study abroad program, although I was just 14. But I think that's where I got a lot of my desire to pursue this uh, in the future as as to study the culture and the religion of the Holy Land. Uh, That's what I love most. And of course, that's tied in with Scripture uh, so um, intricately. And so... The the Ludlow name is kind of a household name (laughs) around these parts. Yeah. And so I'm just trying to not 
mess up, you know. <laughs> the, the family the legacy. family <laughs> legacy, you know, being, you know, having my grandfather also here earlier. Um, but when I started here at BYU, I, I felt like I wanted to do something international, but this is what really, you know, is what I wanted to study more and, and learn more. And so I, I did Near Eastern Studies when I was here as an undergraduate and then I went off to UC Berkeley and did Biblical Hebrew. So I kind of started more in the Old Testament area, kind of wanted to do Biblical history, that kind of thing. Um, but then as I took a class on the origins of Christianity uh, there at Berkeley, I, it kind of shifted my focus more towards the New Testament period, which also meant, unfortunately, that I had to study Greek and add that <laughs> to, you know, trying to uh, study more language. But... Um, ended up, as I uh, mentioned earlier, settling on the Second Temple Jewish period. And it's kind of the relation of ancient Judaism with early Christianity. That's where I really like to see how things go. And so I did my PhD at UC Berkeley with uh, the Graduate Theological Union, which was right next door to the Berkeley, a consortium of about nine different seminaries, Jesuit, um, Protestant. Uh, they later had a Jewish studies program and so forth. But anyway, um, that was where my PhD was. And after receiving my PhD, I went off to BYU-Hawaii and taught there for six years in the history and religion departments. Um, kind of had a split appointment there. And then uh, 15 years ago, came here to BYU in the ancient scripture department. And I mostly teach New Testament, Book of Mormon, sometimes Old Testament. I've taught at the BYU Jerusalem Center twice for a year each and love that experience. And, and we probably should mention as well, you were uh, recently appointed to be the director of the Religious Studies Center. The publications director of the Religious Studies Center. And so I'm trying to manage a lot of... Uh, interesting projects all the way from um, early church history to ancient biblical stuff. And so it's it's been a great learning experience because a lot of it is beyond what I've normally studied. And yeah, just today we signed or finalized papers for we're going to start doing Brigham Young journals yeah. um, <clears throat> that will come out of the Religious Studies Center. So you heard it here first, everyone. This is this is fresh off the press. So exactly. Thank you for that. Uh, one one final question, and and I, I know that you shared parts of your testimony earlier, but but we love to ask as as a scholar, what is it that grounds you in your faith? Uh, Elder Maxwell talked about you know being a disciple scholar. What is it that that roots you in in the restoration and in your Christian faith? I would have to say the primary thing would be the Holy Spirit. Um, I can study a lot of things and I can learn a lot of the historical context, but that it's the Holy Spirit that gives me the testimony, that gives me the desire to be faithful, to follow, to, to make and keep these covenants. And that comes through the scriptures mostly, you know, trying to dive into them, understand them better, uh, pray about them, prepare lessons to teach um, in those variety of, of settings multiple, multiple times. I've felt the Holy Spirit, you know, strengthen my testimony of these things. And, you know, if... If there's one weakness as a teacher that I wish I could do better at is then transmitting that spirit into the classroom to make sure the students also are feeling that testimony and that spirit. I think sometimes that happens, but sometimes I just feel like I have this experience in my office and then I go to the classroom and it doesn't quite translate the same and, and that can be frustrating, but I'm grateful when it does um, work out. But I think overall, um, it's just through the Holy Spirit that continues to testify to me that particularly the Book of Mormon 
is the word of God and that, you know, testifies of Joseph Smith as a prophet. Uh, and that through him we've, and through the Book of Mormon, we have a greater understanding of Jesus Christ, of the atonement of Jesus Christ, of the things we need to do to prepare to return to the presence of God. And, you know, I like how our doctrine is one that connects through all time. When we're talking about Enochic Judaism or, or these strains of Jewish thought before Christ, one of the challenges scholars have is there seem to be these Christian elements in some of these things, and, and yet Jesus hasn't even been born yet, so how can this be? And I think Latter-day Saints would say that's because it's it's continu continuous, you know, it's the same, um, some of the same principles that are pre-Christian, post-Christian, etc., uh, that uh, are part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat, the host and producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, Ryan Sharp, and Hank Smith. Recording, mixing, and original music was done by BYU student Mitchell Bashford. Say hi, Mitchell. Hi, hey guys. Original music and scoring for Why Religion podcast was also created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.